Good morning. Good morning. We are here today with Mona Baker, Professor Emerita of Translation Studies at the University of Manchester. Thank you for having us. Thank you for the interview. <laughs> Professor Baker, Translation Studies, how did it emerge and how has it evolved in the last decades? Um, it's a difficult question because it goes back several decades now and um, like every story you say, uh, as you probably know, I'm very much into narrative theory, like every story you, um, you try to tell where you decide the starting point is, is a matter of how you see things, it's not an empirical reality as it were. Um, so for me, of course, there's been, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's been work on um, translation, scholarly work on translation, going on for a very long time. Uh, but translation studies as a discipline that is recognized in the, in the humanities and uh, in the academy in general um, really probably dates back only, um, again, depends on what you mean by recognized and the extent um, uh, to which it was recognized. Um, say, for instance, here in the UK, um, I would say that kind of we're talking about very, very late 80s, early 90s. That's when people started to talk about something called translation studies, uh, with a great deal of suspicion at the beginning, um, because uh, translation was largely, and until relatively recently, seen as a vocational activity, not an area of research. An academic discipline, by default, uh, involves research. And so I would say really kind of early 90s when people started talking about it, uh, lobbying for it to be recognized as an academic discipline. And that's uh, in terms of the UK is more or less, I would say, right. It may, may have been different in other countries. Um, when I started doing work on translation and when I even started um, writing, in other words, or thinking about doing something that might lead one day to writing uh, something like, in other words, uh, there was no such thing really uh, as a discipline. Um, and in fact, I had great difficulty finding a master's degree uh, to do on translation to prepare me to do, uh, think about it in a scholarly way. Um, and so I ended up having to do an MA in special applications of linguistics with translation forming a very, very small part of it. And that was the best I could do in the late 80s. Uh, and then the situation changed gradually because a lot of people have been involved in developing the discipline in different ways, in different directions. And it's evolving even today because uh, people have different ideas about what translation studies is and what it covers and where the boundaries are. I mean, in that respect, of course, you could say it's not different from any other discipline because the boundaries of any discipline are always fluid and a matter of contestation. Does this count as part of translation studies or not? Uh, in the many years, I um, um, took on the role of uh, editor of uh, a major international journal, the translator. That question kept coming again and again um, when you have papers submitted for publication in a journal such as the translator you will find that lots of referees members of the advisory and editorial board will all disagree sometimes about whether this really is a paper for a journal on translation studies or this is beyond the boundaries of translation studies what i found what i find interesting in the past few years and i welcome that development is that that boundary is expanding now, and things that uh, maybe 10, 20 years ago people would have thought of as absolutely beyond translation studies, not our business, we, you know, somebody else's politics or social sciences or whatever, are now taken very seriously as very much part of the discipline. So that's, that's encouraging. And uh, you have been a professional translator, you have worked in academia, you have perhaps done both things at the same time, mm -hmm. at a certain point. Mm -hmm. How has the role of the translator as an individual, and also as a collective, changed? I think it has changed quite dramatically for a start, and partly because of um, developments on the ground in the world outside academia, partly because of 
developments in the humanities at large and partly because of the lobbying that many people have been doing in academia to recognize um, translators. Uh, that role has changed quite dramatically. There has There is a lot more visibility now of translators and interpreters, it's very important interpreters as well, are much more visible now than they used to be. Um, We've had developments like the many wars we've had since, really since the early 1990s, the first Gulf War and so on, where um, interpreters became very visible on the ground and, um, and also um, things like court cases um, um, falling, um, being rejected because of performances by interpreters. All these things coming together have uh, given interpreters and translators more visibility than in the past when people just thought about the literary translator working in a kind of uh, space of their own without much connection, much direct impact on the rest of the world. And also partly because of the kind of work that people like Lawrence Venuti and others have been doing in order to bring translators and interpreters to the attention of um, the wider society, including even publishers and, uh, and people who read literary translations and so on. So that role has become, one aspect of that is the increased visibility of translators and interpreters uh, in society. Um, they also, they, from the scholarly perspective, other um, development that again I welcome and I um, think it's very much working in our favor as a discipline, is that other disciplines have become much, much more interested in translation. In fact, um, some other disciplines are now talking about the translation turn in their disciplines. Uh, and uh, they are engaging with, uh, as all disciplines um, have to, they're engaging with actual translation work, actual professional translators and interpreters, and not just professional translators and interpreters, but for example, activist translators and interpreters, people who engage in translation and interpreting not in order to uh, make a living, but because they are committed to a cause and this is uh, a way of promoting that cause. There's also been a lot more interest in an awareness of the complexity of the ethical side of translation and interpreting in the real world and, and uh, a lot of the um, codes of practice and codes of ethics that are adopted by the major uh, institutions that represent translators and interpreters uh, and which were adopted in the abstract and had little to do with what actually happens on the ground in uh, diverse situations. All these codes are being contested now and they have to be brought down to reality to show that the translators, translators and interpreters are not uh, robots. Uh, they're not machines, they don't just uh, interpret faithfully in an, abstract, in an abstract way, that there are lots of um, um, things that go around uh, the, the interpreting or translating situation that influence uh, their decisions on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, and therefore these abstract categorical uh, uh, codes um, are not kind of I, I don't think that they are taken as seriously now as they used to, uh, to, and that obviously has an impact on the way people view professional translators and interpreters and their role in the uh, unfolding communication. Mm. Uh, do you believe that with this expansion of the discipline, translation, not just being interdisciplinary but standing on its own two feet, has it caused anatomization in the last few years? Uh, are translators now becoming specialized in such a way that they create their own sub-discipline? Uh, yes, I think you have a point there. I think there's a lot of that going on uh, within the discipline and therefore uh, you sometimes uh, um, hear kind of people arguing very vociferously for having a completely independent um, interpreting studies discipline or a completely independent audiovisual uh, translation discipline or um, sign language interpreting uh, and so on. And to some extent they're right in that there is quite a, a diverse landscape out there and these things are, all these activities are quite different from each other in some very key um, ways. At the same time, uh, it's the uh, inevitable argument for any kind of process of this type, which is that um, you have to find a happy medium because if you, uh, if you have too many splinters within the discipline, A, you weaken your position in the academy, 
an academy in order to be able to get funding to uh, um, to employ people to uh, to develop um, courses uh, for any kind of discipline you have to have a critical mass of both topics and people working in that discipline and therefore um, going against this idea of splintering the discipline into uh, very specialist areas and therefore also splintering the professional activity into uh, very, very sp specific specialist areas. One of the arguments is that you uh, weaken everybody rather than uniting to form a critical mass. For translators and interpreters on the ground, um, I think from what I hear from a lot of people, it's been a while since I've done um, any actual uh, translation. I never did really uh, much interpreting. Uh, from what I hear, people can't really survive on a very specialist niche area. They have to have lots of different skills. Uh, and in fact, training tends to go in that direction now. So if you look at MAs in translation and interpreting, they try to give a little bit of specialization, but also a, a, a broader set of skills for translation and interpreting, because otherwise you can't survive on the market. There is just isn't enough of a particular type of specialist work to keep you going um, and, and to, to allow you to make a living out of it. You have led various European and international projects related to translation. Um, how? Going back to that position of well, suspicion against translation as a discipline separate from any other thing, how did you, how were you capable of proving that there was translation beyond linguistics, and that there could be a social impact and a relevant policy side to it? Yeah, I think you can only do that over a long period of time. You don't. Uh, that's a, a principle in life in general. You don't change people's views overnight. Uh, or with huge big splashes of intervention. It's a kind of, uh, you have to do it collaboratively, you can't do it on your own, so you have to do it by working together with the community of translation studies uh, scholars, uh, and you have to do it by also being able to talk to uh, people on the ground, professional translators and interpreters, the associations that um, represent them. So um, I remember one of the earliest things I did was uh, to be active in the inter uh, Translation and Interpreting Institute here in, um, in the UK. I was for a while the chair of the Education Committee and I had this argument all the time with people you know, who were at that point, that was in the 80s, only saw translation as something you do in kind of in the workplace. The academy just confuses things, all these academics can't really do anything, offer anything for us. And so uh, that was working on, that was one angle of it, is to be able to speak about translation with one voice rather than um, showing other disciplines and society at large that there are all these um, tensions even within, between the discipline and the profession. Uh, so that was one angle. Another angle is really by, by doing work collaboratively, both individually and collaboratively, that highlights the impact uh, of, of translation. And sometimes you get opportunities that really make a big difference because um, they are areas that everybody knows about. And so the before I started the current project, I had a, an 18 month fellowship to look at the role of subtitling in the Egyptian revolution. And of course, at that point in 2012, 12, 2013, everybody was talking about the revolutions, everybody was talking particularly about Egyptian revolution and following it, and therefore linking a, a type of translation to that kind of momentous uh, period of history was, I think, um, a particularly useful way of highlighting the impact of translation on something like this. But then you have to work not at just showing linguistic choices in, in a vacuum. You, it would be counterproductive to uh, approach something like this, a situation like this, and say, okay, I'm going to show you all the errors that these subtitlers did in rendering what was uh, going on. That would be a very, very um, counterproductive move. And so the point was to find some way of showing that the choices that the subtitlers made in a very specific context had an impact on the way people understood what was going on. But that impact, it, it had an impact not because they made errors, but because the choices had political ramifications. Mm -hmm.
um, and and that's what I tried to do. And uh, several things came out of that. Is a collection uh, of articles which won um, an award uh, entitled "Translating Dissent: Voices from and with the Egyptian Revolution," and um, an article I published in the translate in the translator about these choices and uh, based on interviews also with the subtitlers and with the filmmakers um, active in the Egyptian revolution. So you, you try, I think, to find opportunities that lend themselves to bringing the conversation outside the boundaries of the discipline into the wider society and, and, uh, and in collaboration with other disciplines. Or So people in social movement studies were very interested in this and, and, and read these things, because, not because they were particularly interested in translation, but because they're interested in um, events such as the Egyptian revolution as a form of um, social movements. And finally, where do you see translation going in the future? Um, I see translation opening up even further. Uh, at the moment, I see it, uh, and there, there's a lot of evidence showing uh, that it is uh, almost hijacked by other disciplines. It's become um, a key concept in so many other disciplines. Um, and people, even research councils here in the UK, UK, the fellowship I had to study subtitling in the Egyptian Revolution was part of an initiative by the Arts and Humanities Research Council entitled Translating Cultures and inviting people to engage with translation issues. This is the same council that only a few years before uh, would not give any money to anybody working on translation because it wasn't serious enough. And so I see, I see translation really uh, opening up to the humanities, uh, engaging more people in the humanities and even beyond the humanities in the sciences and becoming uh, much more uh, central to the humanities than it was two or three decades ago. Professor Baker, thank you very much. Thank you.